So I'm Doug Hanks. I'm the Director of Architecture here at Juniper. And up next, what I want to do is share with you guys uh, our new spine switch. It's the QFX 10,000. Um, should I wheel it a little bit closer so you guys can see it? Or you want to? Yeah, if I can. Sure. Pass it around. Yeah, pass it around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this thing's heavy. <laughs> Here we go. You're doing data center work. Oh, you're in front of the presentation now. Crap. That's it's fine. It's fine? Uh, okay. We don't I wasn't that he was talking to the rack. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> like he's lost his mind. <laughs> okay. Here is a snapshot of our switching portfolio. Uh, so on the top, we have our spines, and we basically have this merchant silicon plus juniper silicon switching strategy. I mentioned previously the, the spines, they're based on the Q5 juniper silicon. This is the do anything silicon, whether it's MPLS, VXLAN, what have you. And then on our lease, we have our merchant silicon. Uh, today it's based on Broadcom. And we have everything from 10 gig, 40 gig, copper, fiber, what have you. We got the option for you. Um, so obviously, um, we got lots of different shapes and sizes of our spine, which is from very small, which is 36 ports of uh, 40 gig, going all the way to our big monster over here, which is almost close to 500 ports of uh, 40 gig. Um, basically, in front of you is our uh, 10,008. It has eight slots. Uh, pretty typical, you have your routing engines up top and your line cards. Um, However, one thing we did a bit differently here is we have something called an orthogonal direct, uh, direct connect. Because typically when your line cards uh, plug into your chassis uh, here, it goes into a mid-plane device. Uh, we got rid of that because we actually found the copper traces in the, the mid-plane actually limit your uh, expansibility in your chassis. So when you plug in your switching fabric from the back, they, they uh, pair up the line cards directly and there's no mid-plane whatsoever. So as, l as long as you... Uh, uh, as, as new line cards come out, whether it's 3 terabits per slot or 6 terabits per slot or 12 terabits per slot, as long as you have the correct switching fabric in the back, this chassis should last a very, very, very long time. So there's no built-in limitations in terms of the back plane uh, to this uh, particular device. Um, so I mentioned it is the do-all switch, uh, IP, MPLS, VXLAN. Um, however, uh, I didn't really talk about the scale too much, but this thing is a beast when it comes to scale. Um, you can take a quick look here. It's basically uh, half a million uh, LPM in the FIB, and uh, half of that is for V4, and the other half is for V6. So a quarter million V4 and a quarter million V6, and the actual FIB. The rib is in the millions, tens of millions. Um, we start talking about the... Um, the FIB again is actually an upgrade, so if that is not enough for you, you have a license to go to 1 million overall. So you can imagine a lot of different use cases for this particular switch. It's not like your typical merchant silicon where you're going to have limitations are in the hundreds of thousands typically. So this is going into the millions. Um, tons of host routes, and we have a lot of buffer uh, in the switch as well. So about 100 milliseconds per port, whether it's 10 or 40, or even 100 gig, we have the same amount of buffer uh, per port. So, pretty cool. Um, the technologies, uh, it's tri-speed, uh, it's 10 gig via a breakout cable, uh, obviously. Uh, it has native 40 gig. So I have a, a line card here, we call this a 36Q. Uh, it has natively uh, QSFP 28 ports, uh, 36 of those. Obviously breakout cables can go into a four by 10. Or um, the next thing is that we have 100 gig uh, as well. So basically what we have, you, you can turn these ports into 100 gig. And I'll show you how we do that. We have little port groups, and for every three ports, we can turn one of them into 100 gigs. One of the interesting use cases is for this is collapsing your edge router. So traditionally, you build out a data center like this, spine leaf, whatever technology you want to use, and then you have your WAN routers or your edge routers or whatever these are. And now what we can do is basically bring that directly into the spine itself because of the scale and the feature set of this particular switch. It's like, well, if I have an MPLS WAN, no problem. I can do that on the spine. If I got a ton of routes, well, I got the FIB and the, and the RIB to support that now. So any to any encapsulation comes in handy in a use case like this. Um, 
Here's a quick matrix of the, uh, the, the rough scale of these boxes. Um, again, uh, 36Q uh, all the way to the larger chassis. Um, I put the MAC, uh, the FIB, and the number of ACLs in here. Um, it is exactly the same on every single attribute except the, uh, the MAC. And um, we basically just put a, uh, a soft limit on that just because of the number of ports. It's like you're never going to learn 1 million uh, Macs on a 36-port device, and that's why it didn't make sense. But otherwise, there's absolutely no difference from our smallest box to our largest box in terms of functionality, in terms of the buffer, the latency, the features, uh, the, this type of scale, it's exactly the same because it's based on that same chipset as the Juniper Q5 chipset. So no compromise there in terms of where you're going in this product family. Um, I'll, I'll pause there. That makes sense to you guys. Pretty cool numbers. Yeah. Okay. The hardware is really cool. Um, back on the slide before on your design, um, do you guys in your spine and leaf designs typically connect the rest of the world, the rest of the Stuff, that stuff outside the data center to the spine? Because always before I've seen it to the leaves, to leaves. Right. Um, it's a good architecture question because generally if it goes to a leaf, there is an assumption that you're connecting many different WAN routers into it and you want to extend an expensive port to a cheaper port on the leaf. Um, however, if you have a scenario like this where it's just two or even four edge routers, it'll probably make sense just to plug it directly into the spine and not go through a leaf just because of the port density and the, the cost of it. Yeah, I guess I'd agree. If you just have two like that, then might as yeah. well. But I've always seen it as spine is fabric, period. Mm -hmm. and yeah, yeah. Else and we're we're changing like. that up now because now you can connect directly into it and get more functionality out of it. But see, if you, if you plug this into a leaf, um, you couldn't start doing MPLS and the high scale and things like that because the leaf is based on you know a Broadcom chipset. Right. So if you're if right. you're collapsing the functions, then yeah. Right. Right. Sense. Into the spine. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Um, here is the software architecture. Uh, I had a question before. You know what version of Linux? It's uh, Wind River. Uh, this is basically a, uh, a server. We, we've used uh, some of the latest Xeon processors in this. It's uh, uh, quad core. Um, there's 32 gigs of uh, DDR memory in here. We have SSD hard drives. It looks and feels just like a server. Um, and we put Yocto on top of that. And uh, we have Linux KVM running as well. So whether it's your, your big chassis like this, where obviously you have two different routing engines, and that allows you to do ISSU, um, we can actually take our smaller box, which doesn't have redundant routing engines, but we get the same ISSU functionality through KVM, because now we put our network operating system inside of a VM, and we got a backup uh, network operating system. We can do ISSU between these two virtual uh, routing engines, so pretty cool there. Obviously, you can expand that, put your own stuff on it uh, in a guest VM, or you can do containers, whatever you like to do. And we've pulled a lot of the uh, functionality out of uh, Junos that wasn't you know, OSPF or BGP or core networking uh, technology. And we've put that uh, directly on top of uh, Yocto. So we pulled out a lot of our chipset drivers uh, for you know, Q5 or Broadcom or what have you. We put the drivers directly on top of Yocto Linux as a, uh, an RPM module. And actually, all these daemons are RPM modules now. So whether it's the platform to control the fans, the FPGAs, or what have you, that firmware is now a daemon, as well as our analytics, the automation, and of course, any kind of apps that you guys want to put on top of that. Um, and then kind of round this out, I, I already talked about the, the CLI, the structured data. But some more detail I want to give you is that we do uh, a lot of our API through Apache Thrift. So regardless of what programming language that you guys like, Perl, C, Python, whatever, we, hit, we give you IDLs uh, for the structured data. And you can use your favorite programming language to program the switch. And you can program the control plane or the data plane or any of the platform uh, things as well, just as fan speed and things like that. So we give you every bit by end register that you really want on a switch like this. So on the, um, the KVM piece, so when you do an OS upgrade, it just spins up a new guest OS, you apply the new patch or the new version yeah. of the Junos and it works exactly that the same way as a, a physical chassis with two routing engines. We upgrade yeah. one, we switch it over through um, 
uh, graceful restart and upgrade that one and flip it back over so they're both the same uh, version. Is it possible to run two different versions and carve up the switch? Uh, you two know, if versions. I want two versions of the Juno Slayer. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. even spin up my own version. Yeah, or you, is that you, on you, a white you box? You can spin it up and put a different version on there and keep it dormant. Right. Um, switching to it would be dependent on what rev it is. You can't go too many revs ahead or too many revs behind. Right. So, yeah. You Again, not a real use case, <laughs> but, you know, something I might want to try. Yeah. <laughs> a little sandbox <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah, you never know. Can you say again, are you exposing REST APIs natively externally from the device? We are, yeah, yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll do so up here through um, Apache Thrift externally. Yep. And you know, right now, all of the libraries you guys have, like PyEasy and things like that, are using NetConf to come into the device? Yeah, the PyEasy will use uh, NetConf. I didn't put it up here, but yeah, NetConf would be up here as well. So there's lots of different ways into yeah. this box. Yang, NetConf, uh, JSON directly, or go through Apache Thrift. Can you, I'm sorry if you said this earlier, but you know, is the REST, when you're using REST to the device, you know, is REST underneath still using NetConf? Is it, I'm sorry, say it one more time? Is it, when you're using REST to communicate to the device, like, is the device just translating that back into NetConf? Oh, I'm not sure on that one. Damon, do you know? Yes. Ah, it okay. is. Yeah, thank you. That makes sense. I mean, the configuration, yeah, yeah. the configuration at the lowest level is XML. Yeah. So that makes sense. Cool. Question: yep. If I want to use this in a multi-tenant environment, is there any way to create multiple uh, contexts on it? Uh, context? Uh, no, we, we just do it logically through uh, VRFs and bridge domains. Okay. Yeah. Um, on the MX, we had something, or our, our, our MX router, we had a, a concept called um, ELSIS, like a logical switch. We found out that although we had that for 15 years, really no one actually ends up using it. And we didn't want to waste engineering cycles to implement something that no one ever used into a, a new switch. So we wanted to focus more on EVPN and things like that instead. Yeah. Okay. We've um, got about five more minutes, so let me give you a quick overview. Uh, this is our smaller uh, QFX 10,000 switch. Uh, this is the 72Q uh, version, obviously 72 ports. Um, this thing has an oven-baked oscillator for uh, PTP, so you can act as a grandmaster for your entire data center. Um, and we also use that uh, oven-baked oscillator for uh, time stamping of packets. So we start talking about the analytics, the monitoring pieces. We can get very precise in terms of when a packet comes in and goes out of this box. So if you need that level of granularity, we have that built into the box, into the hardware itself. Um, I do want to mention the, uh, the port group. So I mentioned that we can basically take a, a 40 gig port and turn that into a native uh, 100 gig port. And uh, this is what the port groups look like, little, little Tetris type shape. Um, <laughs> And basically what you see here is a bunch of red and green. So what I'm showing in the red is ports that are disabled and in green are the ports that are 100 gig capable. So obviously for this, this yellow L shape, you'll see that here. So we disabled two ports to enable one port of 100 gig. So when you do the math, we take 72 ports of native 40 gig and we can turn that into 24 ports of 100 gig on the same box. So that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll pause here. Any questions on that? OK. Um, I did mention the mid-plane list design. Um, I'll skip this piece. Um, the different line card options. Uh, we have this line card here currently installed. This is the 36 port uh, QSFP line card. Uh, the same rules apply to this line card if you want 10 gig or 100 gig, you can uh, change those. So we uh, do tri-speed on the line cards as well. And here we have a 30 port one, a native 100 gig line card. And we can go backwards if you really need to, if you want to do 40 gig or, or what have you. So two options there. So this is how we get the uh, really dense 40 and 100 uh, gig port density out of this box at scale. Uh, the last line card is a, uh, a native 10 gig. Um, 
Typically, the use case might be that you want to terminate a bunch of WAN connections or um, colored optics, one gig or 10 gig. Uh, we can do so with this line card. And then we have uh, six more ports of uh, QSFP plus, and we can you know, turn those into 100 gig if you need to as well. So a lot of different combinations on the switch in terms of connectivity and applying to different use cases, whether it's hosting, software as a service, collapsing your WAN, we can do it all well, with this one switch here. How you get air through that thing? Um, this one is, uh, we have little air inlets here and on the sides, and also a lot of them up here for the 100 gig. But this thing is a beast when it comes to cooling. We actually kind of push the limits and we borrow a lot of the uh, technology you'll find in like prosumer gaming. If you ever see the heat sinks in some of these uh, exotic designs, it's like a, uh, a copper Brillo pad, not <laughs> a regular heat sink. So we go to the extreme to cool these things down. I'm waiting for the <laughs> first liquid cooled top of rack switch. It's <laughs> almost getting to that point. Where does the radiator go? <laughs> what's, uh, what's the total back plan on one of these? Like what kind of oversubscription are you looking at when it's full? Uh, there is no oversubscription on the back plane. Uh, it is N plus one. So in case of a failure, um, you still have 100% bandwidth. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I've got two minutes. Let me figure out what I'd like to close on. Um, I'd like to close maybe on this point um, and then go into the hybrid memory cube. So what we have today, where I talked about the, uh, the routers, and what I've done is I try to map this against these, uh, these attributes, buffer going all the way down to latency, and compare that to our QFX5100 switch, which is a different chipset. So this is the Trio chips that we built in-house specifically for WAN applications. And this one is for access applications based on Broadcom. You'll see that we're really, really strong in the buffer features and logical scale in the WAN, which makes sense. And we're really, really strong down here on the latency and the throughput and the power efficiency where it makes sense as well, but not so much scale. So when we design this particular system with the, uh, the Juniper Q5 chipset, we want something in the middle, actually, not too far on the left or too far on the right. And this is where it comes in. We try to even out these bar graphs because we don't need as much scale as we need in the WAN, but again, if we start tackling the cloud, the hosting, the SP use cases, we gotta you know, go and be above and beyond where Broadcom is currently at on T2. But we have to uh, bring up the throughput, the power, and the latency as well. So it's basically a, a, a meet in the middle compromise. Um, and we mentioned the hybrid memory cube. Um, typically what happens is when you build a switch, you need a lot of TCAM or you use a lot of DDR3 memory. But in this case, if you want to go above, above and beyond traditional TCAM limits or DDR3 limits, we need a new memory module. So basically what we've done is there's a, uh, a vendor called uh, Micron and they basically build this 3D stacked uh, memory. And you can kind of see here, uh, it's super fast, it's super small. And the reason that we did this is, on this next slide, is if we used regular DDR3 memory, um, it would require a lot of DDR3, like 90 DIMMs on a line card. It's just not feasible in terms of the uh, number of pens and the power and the surface area. So you, you take a look at this, it, the DIMMs would take up the entire line card and nothing is left for ASICs or optics or any of that. So we had to move towards HMC to actually accomplish this. So when you get a lot of features, a lot of scale, and a lot of buffer, we had to get away from traditional technology and go towards uh, newer technology like HMC. So I'm at the top of my hour. Um, I'll take any more final questions and I'll uh, leave you with a summary. Um, it's the do anything switch, IP, VX, LAN, what have you. A lot of different use cases, IT as a service, software, and hosting into one switch. Uh, yes, it is shipping. <laughs> yes, today it's shipping. Sorry, I thought, I thought that was known, but I'll, uh, yeah, it's shipping today. <laughs>